This week on The Communicators, a discussion about the current wireless industry with Martin Cooper, who is credited for the creation of the mobile cell phone. Well, recently on this program, Robert McDowell was our guest. He's an FCC commissioner. And during that interview, he mentioned somebody who's very influential in telecommunications industry. Here's what he had to say. Uh, I was recently speaking to the inventor of the cell phone, who is, we all know who the inventor of the wireline phone is, Alexander Graham Bell. Do we know the, the name? We should all know this fellow's Don't name. Don't shame He's, me on TV. No, no, I'm not going to shame you. His name is Marty Cooper. Most 99.99% uh, of America has never heard of him. He's huh. the most influential person uh, nobody's ever heard of. Hmm. Um, and he's in his 80s now. And uh, you should have him on this program at some point. And here he is. This is Marty Cooper on your screen. Mr. Cooper, we're not sure whether to curse you or thank you for inventing the cell phone. Well, Peter, would you give up your cell phone? because of this, uh, all these disadvantages? I don't think so, <laughs> and that's true of most people. So the, uh, the benefits, I think, uh, outweigh the, uh, the curses. Could you briefly tell us what your role was or is in the invention of the cell phone? Well, uh, it's a long story, uh, and it has to do with the fact that AT&T invented cellular telephony uh, and as far back as 1946, if you would imagine. And then in the 1960s, uh, they suggested that they were prepared to commercialize it. Uh, and uh, they had two conditions. One is that they were the only people technically and financially capable uh, of uh, creating this new concept of cellular telephony. Uh, and therefore, uh, they wanted to have a monopoly. And the second thing, their version of uh, cell phones was car telephones, if you could imagine that. And I was with this little company uh, in Chicago called Motorola. Uh, and uh, our vision was that the time was ready for people to have the freedom of personal portable devices that would let them communicate wherever, uh, wherever they were. So this little company decided to take on the largest company in the world. Uh, and we did. Uh, and by 1973, the FCC was ready to make a decision. And that decision was, monopoly or not, and will the industry get to pick the technology so that you could have portables in contrast with car telephones? And so I decided that the only way to do this is with a dazzling demonstration. And I conceived of this thought of actually building a portable, not only a portable telephone, but the complete system and taking it to Washington to show it to people who are influential there, take it to New York, uh, and let the press uh, look at this and persuade the world that the time was ready for competitive portable, personal portable communications. And uh, history tells us that we were successful. How big was the original cell phone and how much did it cost to develop the technology? The uh, cell phone weighed uh, two and a half pounds. Uh, it was huge, so big. I wish I had brought uh, my model with We have me. a picture of it on the screen. Ah, good, so you know what it looks like. Right. Uh, and the uh, battery it lasted for 20 minutes, but that was not a problem because you couldn't hold it up for 20 minutes. It was so heavy. Uh, and uh, in order to create this phone, which we did uh, in a period of some three months, uh, we literally had to shut down the engineering in our company. We had everybody in the company work on one aspect or another, so you could not have afforded to own that cell phone yourself, Peter. What did it cost? Oh, we, we're, we spent literally hundreds of thousands of 1973 dollars to create you know, that phone. By 1983, the price hadn't gone down that much because in 1983, a commercial cell phone sold for $4,000. Not many people could have afforded that uh, at that time, but we sold a lot of them. And where did the word sell come from? Well, the, the whole concept of, cell, of cellular telephony uh, has to do with spectral efficiency, and I hope we're going to talk about that uh, later. Uh, it's the idea of being able to reuse the radio spectrum many times in one geographic area. The old way was you put up a tower in the middle of a city, and you occupied a radio channel for a single conversation over the entire city and maybe uh, 50 or 100 miles beyond that. With cellular telephony, you divided the city up into little areas, 
Naturally, we engineers had to come up with a new name for that. We call them cells. Uh, and it's possible to use a frequency in one cell, and then a few cells over, you use the same frequency again and again and again. Spectral efficiency, reuse of the spectrum. And of course, when you do that, people do move. That's the whole principle of being portable. You have to hand off. You have to have a continuous conversation as you move from cell to cell. So that is what the fundamentals of cellular telephony is. Reuse and handoff. Uh, well, Marty Cooper, uh, Robert McDowell, the commissioner, went on to talk about your theory of spectral efficiency. And what is that theory? Well, the, the real issue uh, has to do with what the size of the spectrum is. You hear a lot of people talk about spectrum is beachfront property, there's only so much. Well, if you go back, we've been using the radio spectrum for well over 100 years, over 110 years. Uh, and when Marconi used the radio spectrum, uh, he would transmit bits of information, and every bit took six seconds for one bit of information. And we had a very limited uh, frequency range in the spectrum. Somehow or other, we now transmit billions and billions of bits of information uh, every second over the spectrum, uh, and we repeat the spectrum over and over again. Well, the ability for us to transmit information through the spectrum has improved by a trillion times since Marconi did his transmissions. It's literally doubled every 30 months for uh, over 110 years, at least for the telecommunications area. So the spectrum is not a fixed entity. It's a continuously expanding entity. And we believe, we know, those of us that are involved in the technology, that we can keep doing this for the next 50 or 60 years. And the next generation is going to keep that going even beyond that. Well, joining us in our conversation is Paul Kirby, Senior Editor of Telecommunications Reports. Mr. Kirby. You uh, talk about spectral efficiency. The FCC's broadband plan is coming out later this month, and it's going to recommend freeing up 500 megahertz of additional spectrum over the next decade. It will also talk about spectral efficiency and opportunistic uh, uses of spectrum. Is your concern that the plan will focus too much on freeing up more spectrum rather than making use of better use of the frequencies? Well, freeing up more spectrum uh, is a, uh, it's a wish and a hope, but uh, considering the way the uh, Congress and our uh, regulatory agencies have set up the environment, it's very difficult to take spectrum away from somebody once they are licensed. Now, I must uh, preface that with a comment that the spectrum belongs to the public, belongs to us, uh, and it ought to be used uh, in our benefit. But the system we have set up, auctioning, uh, identifying a segment of spectrum with a specific service uh, has uh, made the spectrum almost uh, an issue of ownership. Somebody gets a piece of a spectrum and they treasure that spectrum uh, and uh, don't want anybody else to have access to it. Very hard to gain, uh, to take spectrum back from somebody that has it. But that's not the real issue, Paul. The real issue is how badly do we need new capacity in this spectrum? And uh, Cisco uh, has made an estimate that within the next 10 years, the amount of information that's going to go over our wireless system is going to increase by 40 times. Well, if you're a, uh, an iPhone user in New York, you're already experiencing some really difficult problems squeezing stuff through. Now, just imagine what happens if you increase that by 40 times. You're not going to solve that problem by getting 40 times more spectrum. There isn't 40 times more spectrum. The, the, the uh, cellular carriers now have some 250 megahertz. The chairman has said in his broadband plan that he seeks to add uh, perhaps uh, another total of 500 megahertz, only part of which would go to the cellular carriers. So there may be is the potential to double the amount of spectrum. How are you going to solve the problem with a 40 times increase in capacity? It's new technology, and there is lots of technology available today that the carriers can use and will use when it's in their interest, and there's more coming down the pike, and 
we can talk about those uh, things in detail if you'd like. But the solution to the spectrum problem is not redistributing the spectrum. Uh, it's not taking spectrum away from one entity, not even sharing the spectrum. It is, in fact, creating new capacity, in effect, creating new spectrum. And that potential, that process has been going on for 110 years, and the potential for increasing the amount of spectrum is enormous. So what should the government do to give the incentive then for that to occur? Or should they require the spectrum uh, efficient technology? Well, that's a superb uh, comment. Because in the past, uh, the, this increase that I talk about, doubling every two and a half years, it hasn't been uniform. It's happened in spurts. And what has caused those spurts? Well, uh, the biggest is, reason is that <coughs> people get starved. They need new spectrum. They have a new application. It's important. We've uh, fought that battle in the land mobile industry uh, in the 1950s and uh, 60s. And so they become creative, innovative, and they create new techniques. And the other process is the government says, if you get new spectrum, you have to use it efficiently or we won't give it to you. Uh, and that's what happened uh, in the case of cellular technology. The, the uh, whole process of cellular technology occurred because AT&T said, we, if you give us 30 megahertz, 30, remember we have 250 today, if you give us 30 megahertz, we'll never be back again. We have this new technology called cellular. We can keep making the cells smaller and smaller and smaller and we will never be back for new spectrum again. And here we are now, uh, 35 years later, perhaps 40 years later, uh, and the industry has 250 megahertz, and they're saying we badly need new spectrum. Now, the fact is that if the, the carriers are required to use more spectrally efficient techniques to actually measure their spectral efficiency uh, and report on it, I think we're going to find that there's going to be a lot of innovation and a lot of new technology. Are there, are there uh, people who use the spectrum who aren't using it efficiently right now, in your view? Well, uh, I hate to pick on the broadcasters, but everybody else does, so, so I will too. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, broadcast industry in the 1950s used some 17 6 megahertz channels, which is a huge amount of spectrum, for one broadcast. And they did that because if you had a broadcast channel, the technology at that time required guard bands of various kinds. Well, it, within five years, the receivers had gotten so much better, and the transmitters, that that wasn't necessary anymore. But the broadcasters continued to occupy that huge amount of spectrum, and they did so until, as you know, last year. So if you could imagine going 60 years using many times more technology than was required, uh, it, it's a perfect example of uh, what we have done with our environment, made the spectrum so valuable that people hang on to it uh, with, uh, with all of their capability. Now, how difficult as a practical matter, we're talking a lot about private spectrum users, wireless carriers and broadcasters. Uh, the government has a lot of spectrum, and in fact, to find 500 megahertz, they're going to have to go to the government. How difficult would it be as a practical political matter to say to the Department of Defense, you must be more spectrum efficient? They could come back and say, we are spectrum efficient. In fact, they do say that, but we can't compromise our sensitive operations. So as a practical matter, how difficult is it to go to the government and say that for their spectrum users? Well, it's very, very difficult, and, and uh, you don't want to single out the government. Uh, it's difficult in any case. The fact is that there are many entities that are working very hard to use this, the uh, spectrum efficiently, and there are many places where it's just uh, impossible to get better, uh, radar being an example. Uh, you use a certain amount of spectrum for radar, and we depend upon that not only for uh, military applications, but in uh, uh, aircraft traffic control. And you don't want to cut these guys back, uh, not if it affects our safety. So uh, it, it would be really desirable if we could put pressure on people to become more efficient, and they will, uh, uh, they'll figure out ways to do it. But the thought that you can 
solve the problem by taking the spectrum away from somebody is naive. Uh, the people that are using the spectrum now in general need that spectrum. Uh, yes, they can improve things, but taking it away from is not going to solve the problem for other people. Even, for the, even taking it away from the broadcasters, as has been indirectly suggested by uh, well, Chairman already, Jedikowski? Yeah, they've already done that to a very large extent, and that's going to help the problem. But the point is, Peter, that the problem is not a 50 megahertz problem, which is the magnitude of spectrum they're finding. It's not a 100 megahertz, not 250 megahertz problem. It's a gigahertz. It's a 1,000 megahertz kind of problem because that's what Cisco says is going to happen in 10 years. Well, the Chairman Janikowski, and by the way, uh, I ought to tell you that there's nothing wrong with what the FC has done. They put a lot of work into this. The plan is a good plan, but they should not give the impression that it's going to solve the problem. The, uh, if, in fact, we do require 40 times more spectrum for telecommunications in the next 10 years, then uh, that comes out to 1,000 gigahertz. Well, there are only th three gigahertz of spectrum that are useful for our kind of thing. So we've got a 30 times improvement. Where are we going to find that? It just doesn't exist. New technology is, is the only way. Why do you say that only three gigahertz is, is useful for cellular technology? Well, it's, it's, all it's useful for uh, telecommunications in general. You know, when you go up above three gigahertz or so, uh, all of a sudden you run into a few problems like rain uh, interferes, uh, and uh, the uh, antennas uh, get to be tiny and, and small, uh, and pretty soon it's very hard to get energy to go through the air. So we, uh, the, the useful part of the radio spectrum, just in my lifetime, has increased considerably. And when I started to work in uh, 1954, uh, we were using uh, 150 megahertz as the highest frequency for voice communications. And little by little, we learned how to do better. We, and by the time we got to cellular, we were up at 800 or 900 megahertz. And now we've got new systems coming on. Clearwire uh, is coming out with WiMAX systems at uh, 2.5 gigahertz, and it works very well. You go beyond 3.5 gigahertz or so, and uh, the physics starts interfering with you. So, uh, there, there is a limit to the frequency range. Now, for the sake of clarification, we talked sure. about broadcasters and getting spectrum back. Chairman Janikowski last week specifically said the plan, the broadband plan we recommend would be a voluntary plan. So TV stations could voluntarily return the spectrum and then share in the proceeds of the auction of that spectrum. Obviously that would take legislation, but just to clarify that, because there had been fears early on by the broadcasters that the FCC would in fact kind of involuntarily reclaim a lot of that spectrum. No, thank you, Paul, for sure. uh, clarifying that. And uh, don't get me wrong, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with redistributing the spectrum, but to believe that that's going to solve this problem is naive. The, the, the benefits, notwithstanding, Peter cursed me a little bit at the beginning, <laughs> uh, the benefits of, of uh, broadband, of the ability to send uh, various kinds of data between us, uh, is going to be enormously more. We've only scratched the surface. There's so much that can be done, and I hope we get to talk about that later, but we're going to need much more than you can get by just uh, picking up 50 or 100 or, or 500 megahertz uh, by uh, transferring it from broadcasters, no matter how you do that. Now, not to get into too many of the technical details, because our, not all the viewers are engineers, but can you give us some ideas? Now, Smart Antennas are something that a company that you have co-founded, Raycom, develops. What are some of the other technologies that can make better use of the spectrum rather than just seeking more spectrum? Sure. Well, uh, we ought to talk about Smart Antennas for just a second. Uh, uh, what is the principle? Well, think about all these cells that we talked about earlier that, that you uh, asked about, Peter. Each one of these cells is a radio station. It transmits and receives. It, there's an antenna. You've seen these all over Washington. They transmit in all directions to reach out to, the, uh, to their subscribers, and they receive everything in all directions. When they transmit, most of the energy that is transmitted is wasted. All that's useful is what comes to the 
antenna of your cell phone. And when this station listens, it listens in all directions, and it hears all these other things, and all it wants to hear is your cell phone. And what the smart antennas do is they use an array of antennas, a lot of processing, and they, when they listen to you, they focus in on you and listen only to you and reject other people. And when they talk back, they talk back directly to you. What does that do? It lets you talk to a lot more people in the same amount of spectrum with the same equipment. So you use the spectrum more effectively and you save tons of money. That's one way. Uh, another example of the kinds of technology we're talking about, think of the fact that uh, back to these, all these cell sites around Washington, where are they? They're all outside on buildings and towers. Where do we hold our cell phone conversations? 70% of cell phone conversations are inside. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So uh, clever engineers have come up with devices called microcells uh, and femtocells, and these cells are located in buildings. And all of a sudden you have tiny cells, and small cells mean more, spectrally, more spectral efficiency. So that technology is happening. Uh, another thing that carriers are doing today uh, is uh, they're uh, using Wi-Fi, which is in the unlicensed bands, and they're offloading some of the data. So they'll make a cell phone that when it's, you're walking on the streets or you're not in an area where there's a Wi-Fi network, you use the cell, cellular network. When you're in a building or next to a Wi-Fi hotspot, you'll start using that hotspot and not use the rest of the system. So big improvement now. We, we have now offloaded the system. There are techniques for compression. We're sending a lot of information uh, over the airways, and we're learning how to compress that information uh, and send the same amount of information with a lot fewer bits. So these are just a few examples, but there are a lot more. It, Mr. Cooper, do you, uh, do you think that those new technologies are being adopted in the national broadband plan that's due out from Congress shortly? Well, they... Uh, are due out from the FCC? The, uh, the technologies, they are being adopted. And my view is not fast enough. Uh, and the reason is the government, the uh, national policy, uh, does not put appropriate pressure on people to do that. You'll find that the new systems that are uh, being introduced, uh, uh, WiMAX and LTE, they will embrace smart antennas. They will embrace some of these uh, other technologies. They will certainly use more compression. The carriers already announced plans to use femtocells, but there is not, as long as there is the hope that they can get new spectrum, they don't really have enough pressure to introduce into new technologies. And that's the only point that, that I... This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Marty Cooper, who is the inventor of the cell phone. Paul Kirby of Telecommunications Reports, senior editor, is also here. M Mr. Kirby, next question. Another big debate with the broadband plan, it's been a debate and will continue to be, is how to treat public safety. Um, the plan is going to recommend that the FCC re-auction 10 megahertz of other spectrum and leave public safety with 10 megahertz of spectrum it already has nationwide. The public safety community, a lot of them say, we need 20 megahertz. We need twice as much spectrum as we're going to get for, public, for broadband purposes. Um, we talk about spectral efficiency and how spectrum is being used. Public safety people historically will say, we may not always be using the spectrum we have, but when we need it, it's got to be there for us. How do you view the public safety spectrum vis-a-vis -vis spectral efficiency? How do you, can those same techniques apply or, or is, is there kind of a different way of looking at it, kind of like radars, for instance, for the government? Well, first, I, I ought to mention that the public safety segment of our industry has in the past been very spectrally efficient. They've always adopted the, the newest uh, technologies. Uh, and there's no question in any of our minds that they ought to have the highest priority. The, the solution to that problem, uh, in my view, uh, was what they tried to do with this D block in the 700 megahertz range. Uh, uh, and you would think that would have been ideal. And the principle there is, what if we uh, take a, a segment of spectrum uh, and we have share it between public safety and a, a, a uh, commercial network with the understanding 
that when there's an emergency or a need in the public safety area, they could accommodate more and more of the spectrum, but under normal circumstances, the commercial area would use it. Uh, and and uh, in exchange for having this money-making capability, the commercial people could pay for the whole network, uh, and the public safety people would have the benefits of the network. I thought that was ideal. Uh, somehow uh, that didn't work out. Uh, I suspect uh, it was uh, for several reasons. One uh, is the FCC established a price level that was too high to attract people who had to build out this system. Uh, and that was unfortunate because I think they should have given it away. If somebody would actually build that system, think of how we would all benefit. And the second is, uh, there's a question in some people's mind about whether uh, you could commercialize a network where uh, when there's an emergency, you lost the service. Well, I don't think there's any question about that uh, at all. Somehow there is a, a view, which I do not subscribe to, that all systems have to be the same. They all have to have the same level of reliability. Uh, I have a vision of a world where there are lots of different kinds of systems. Uh, and if you cut the price down low enough for a service and say, well, uh, you're going to have this service 95 or 98 percent of the time, but if there's an emergency, you're going to be out of business. But boy, is it low cost. I think you'll find a lot of customers. So I, I, I hope that this uh, concept of a shared system uh, between public safety and commercial uh, is uh, uh, brought back to life. Marty Cooper, what's your uh, thoughts about some of the uh, uh, brain cancer warnings that have been given about cell phones? Well, for, first of all, let me tell you, Peter, I, I am not a doctor. Uh, I am a, a very heavy uh, cell phone user. Uh, I've been using portable two-way radios uh, for um, 50 years. I hate to talk about those long time. You might even figure out how old I am if I keep doing that. Uh, there have been lots and lots of studies. As far as I know, there, there has never been a, a conclusive demonstrated study that has shown that there is an effect uh, on the human body. There are some people that theorize that, but they, we don't know of any specific effect. Right now, the only effect that we're really aware of about RF energy is the way you cook food in your microwave oven. So it is true that when you hold your cell phone up to your head, your brain is being warmed up. Uh, fortunately for us, it's insignificant. The amount of energy coming out of that uh, antenna on your cell phone is so low uh, that the uh, heating effect uh, is negligible. Uh, if you walk past a radio station, you get far more energy. So between all of those things, I don't have a concern about using a cell phone, but I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't worry about it. And if you really care, then you ought to use a hands-free uh, uh, telephone. Now, the people that are really worried about just give up their cell phones. Uh, I could count the number of people in the world that do that uh, on, my, on one hand. What are the similarities between your 1973 brick phone and the iPhone today? Do they share traits? Well, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, brick uh, talked and listened. That was it. Uh, there, it's very hard to buy a phone like that. There, there is a phone like that on the market that my wife invented, as a matter of fact, called the Jitterbug. Uh, and you can buy one, and, and at the moment, uh, the Jitterbug is focused on uh, older people because older people are smart enough to know uh, that a phone doesn't necessarily have to have uh, 100 functions. You don't have to have a camera and an MP3 player and web access and uh, all these other features. Yes, you do. And are you saying you don't tweet? And, and, and uh, Twitter, <laughs> uh, and an instruction manual that's bigger and heavier than the phone itself. So uh, uh, all we could do with that uh, first telephone, and by the way, all we even imagined uh, that we could do was to have a, a superior telephone that was not chained to the wall or, or to your desk. Uh, the only defense we have about not having a, a better vision was there were no computers in 1973, if you could imagine that. 
no computers, personal computers. And there were no cordless phones, there were no closed circuit uh, cameras, there were no digital cameras. So it was even, uh, it was very hard for us to imagine that somebody would someday try to consolidate all these things into one little box. What kind of cell phone do you have? It depends when you ask me. I, uh, I uh, always have the latest cell phone and I try every cell phone out only because people like you keep asking me. Uh, right now uh, I'm using a uh, Droid uh, because I want to get some experience with the uh, uh, Android operating system uh, and uh, it's, uh, I've so far had some pretty favorable results. Uh, I've had an iPhone uh, which I gave to my grandson uh, and which he used for three months and then I had to upgrade to a better version. Uh, and uh, I've tried many other phones. For my day-to-day -day conversations, I actually use a jitterbug. So I carry two phones, one very simple phone that I can flip open that has a very simple phone book and nothing else. Uh, but when I want to Twitter, tweet, tweet, uh, then, and then I use my, uh, my uh, droid. One last quick question. You're on an advisory commission, uh, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Commission, and they advise the Commerce Department on Spectrum Matters. Can you give us a sense of what you would hope that advisory committee would, um, would accomplish in, in advising the Commerce Department on Spectrum? Well, uh, I take these uh, things very seriously, uh, and you've heard all of my opinions, so uh, you can tell I'm not bashful, uh, Peter. Uh, and so uh, we've got some really smart people, including yourself, uh, on this thing. Uh, and we are advising uh, the uh, commission in a, in a, or the uh, Commerce Department, the Assistant Secretary specifically, uh, in a number of areas. And we're trying to establish incentives, as an example, so that people who have Spectrum are incentivized to actually use it more efficiently and maybe let other people share the spectrum with them. So there's a way of doing that. Uh, we are advising the Assistant Secretary on how to respond to a congressional uh, requirement to do uh, a spectrum inventory. Uh, we are advising them in areas uh, that have to do with the transparency of who is using the spectrum. So uh, it's an interesting committee because there are some very bright people on it. It's also interesting because in, the, in uh, the sense that there are disagreements. That probably surprises you that all these smart people don't necessarily agree with each other about everything. And we're going to have to leave it there. Marty Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone, thank you for coming to the Communicators. Paul Kirby, Telecommunications Reports.